So um, welcome everybody to today's event, James Baldwin's Turkish Decade Revisited, featuring Professor Magdalena Zawrowska, Professor of Afro-American and American Studies at the University of Michigan. My name is Arda Göknar. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies with a focus on Turkish. Today's event is part of the Turkish Circle, a Duke and UNC group dedicated to comparative topics on Turkish history, culture, and politics, which is led by Professor Didem Havdeoğlu. Every semester, the Ames Department offers Turkish language courses and seminars in English on aspects of Turkish culture. This spring, Omid Safi and I have a seminar in Istanbul, uh, which includes a section on Istanbul exiles, such as uh, James Baldwin, Leon Trotsky, Ernest Hemingway, Eric Auerbach, and others. In spring, I'll also be offering a seminar on Ottoman and Turkish history through the novels of Orhan Pamuk. Feel free to contact us about these courses. And finally, Didem, uh, Hableol, and I are planning a term two virtual summer program in Istanbul through Duke's Global Education Office. And hopefully we'll have more information about that in the coming weeks. I was asked to make a few comments about the short archival film From Another Place by Sedat Pakai, shot in 1970, shortly before James Baldwin left Istanbul. Professor Zabor, uh, Zobrowska writes in her book, James Baldwin's Turkish Decade, Erotics of Exile, um, few scholars, except for certain biographers, have followed Baldwin to Istanbul in Turkey. And yet that city and country had considerable impact on his career that must be taken into account today when scholars of the African diaspora proclaim, proclaim the importance of the, quote, outer national sites for studying canonical African-American literature. Uh, she goes on to say that <coughs> Baldwin's little-known Turkish decade a period roughly between 1961 and 1971, stands chronologically at the center of his multiple journeys from the Harlem ghetto and Beaufort Delaney's Greenwich Village studio, where he first learned, quote unquote, how to see, through the churches and lecture halls and freedom marches in the South, to the salons of jet setting international literati and the vistas of Southern France of his later years. And she elaborates, <coughs> Baldwin's sense of the positive energy of Turkey as he called it in an interview with Pakai, Sedat Pakai, also had something to do with the personal freedom he experienced there as a man who loved other men in a culture that drew the lines of gender and sexuality strikingly differently. He did not stand out. He was not vilified. He was not questioned about his boyfriends. He was left alone. With regard to the film, she observes that From Another Place begins by displacing and depersonal depersonifying Baldwin, as neither the location nor the time nor even the subject himself is made apparent in the opening shot, a close-up of a chin and hands on the off-white screen. The camera then glides down and focuses on slender finger fingers handling a strand of tespi, Turkish prayer beads or worry beads commonly used in Muslim prayers. We do not see the writer's face and hence do not know who he is. That's the end of the quote. Um, Baldwin's displacement is reinforced throughout the film, a condition that otherwise has allowed him to occupy a, tr occupy a triangulating position and to see the U.S. and its racial politics from the outside, and moreover, to open a productive writerly space. The images of the film are accompanied by music or Baldwin's voiceover. He is shown rising from bed, talking about the importance of seeing and writing from outside the U.S. and getting his work done. He seems to be at ease during interior shots and comfortable while talking, though at times he nervously smokes a cigarette. In exterior shots on city streets, Baldwin appears before Ottoman Islamic ar architecture and monuments, like a flaneur or tourist, people stare at him. In contrast to the interior shots, in the exterior shots, Baldwin seems resigned and even reluctant to, be, to being filmed. And the sequence of scenes removed from plot point to a spectacle, which also recasts the opening scene of his naked body. As if to underscore the performative aspect of the writer in the city, in the middle of the film, the camera lingers, perhaps for too long, on a street sideshow of bear tamers. Baldwin is more at ease in the old bookseller's market in Bayezid, where he finds the recent 1970 Turkish translation of another country, with an alternate but revealing title, Karayavanje, or Dark Foreigner. In 2007, that was that um, 
that book was reissued in a direct translation as Bir Bashka Ulke, uh, or in, in another country directly. In the last sequence, Baldwin is sitting before a mosque with two men inexplicably dressed in formal attire. Bystanders once again stare at him and the spectacle of filming. Significantly, Baldwin's hard to decipher voiceover comments on his feeling quote unquote low and about quote unquote not being present with respect to the movie. The image of him sitting between two official looking men underscores his reluctance despite a knowing wink while he drinks tea to Pakai. Baldwin's declaration of non-presence is significant in the racialized orientalism of the film in which the black man and the Islamic monuments of the city become, conflated, become a conflated note of alterity with respect to the hierarchies of Turkish secular modernity. In the final, in the final seconds of the film, returning to the topic of writing, Baldwin states, quote, I got to move. The film ends with his barely audible words, quote, I got to finish this book. I really got to get out of Istanbul, end quote, as if to confess that life as an exile in the city no longer enables his writerly pursuits. Meanwhile, the images themselves indicate that something approaching a normative gaze has found him here in another country. Um, about the film, Professor Zaborska adds, <clears throat> the film offers a unique window on Baldwin's multivalent identity by questioning and subverting the popular perceptions of him as a, quote, angry, difficult, as, quote, angry, difficult, and imposing, end quote. Um, now that the quote continues, Jim, Jimmy was very different from what I had envis envisioned Pakai wrote of meeting Baldwin and photographing him throughout the 1960s. In a brief note, um, this comment echoes the dis disconnect between the perceptions of Baldwin in Turkey and the United States after the publication of The Fire Next Time, but also the goal of Pakai's film to peer through the a podcast film to peer through the many layers of James Baldwin as a public and private person and a, transna uh, and a transnational Black American. In another context, and I'm switching gears a bit here, commenting on Baldwin's use of the idiom of Black Muslim speech, Professor Ellen McClarney writes, James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time explores the power of Black Muslim speech, what he calls a, an idiom that recognizes and conveys the truth of the Black experience in America. Baldwin writes that the tone of this language, quote, is as familiar to me as my own skin, end quote, suggesting not just a color and a vocal sound, but also a mood and a music. Baldwin draws on hymns of black religion and the black church, quote, the fire next time, end quote, quote, down at the cross, end quote, to depict a contrapuntal relationship between the Christian influenced civil rights movement and black, black Muslim mobilization. Baldwin uses music to explore the cadences and rhythms of Black Muslim speech, but also questions of identity, naming, and authorship. In so doing, he points to a deeper truth about the origins of Black Muslim language, that the Black church and its hymns emerged out of African religion, language, and culture, including Islam. As recent scholars observe, these truths about Black religion, language, and music continue to be sung in the poetry of the Black arts movement in Hip-Hop's, quote, nation conscious wisdom and beyond. So I want to draw attention to these two distinct Islamic contexts, Turkish and US, uneasily but productively brought together here, attention which could be, attention which could be further explored in today's discussion. Uh, so now I'll, I'll introduce um, Didem Havliolo, or, or hand it over to Didem Havliolo, who's professor of Turkish, and also um, recently the author of Miriatun, Performance, Gender Bending, and Subversion in Ottoman Intellectual History. Thank you. Thanks so much, Arda. This was uh, really helpful. Um, I'm sorry. Um, yes, this was really helpful because um, you know part of this event was um, the movie screening uh, far from uh, from another place by Sadat Bakai. We shared a link uh, uh, for you to um, watch on YouTube. We didn't want to do it on Zoom uh, to and and it's still available until the end of the day. And if you cannot uh, you know, do that, we have a copy of the film at the library, so you can check it out. Um, so now, I, well, I, I wanna say a few things about our sponsors. I wanna thank them, um, you know, Asian and Middle East Studies, uh, Dumesk, DISC, African African American Studies at Duke, and Duke and UNC Consortium in Middle East Studies. Uh, and also I want to mention that this event is recorded, um, so keep that in mind. We hope to share it later. 
Um, so now I want to introduce CJ Sud um, and and then and hand it over to Ellen, uh, our discussant today. Um, we're so happy to have CJ here. He is um, a poet, arts educator, community organizer from Chapel Hill, um, from our Chapel Hill, and uh, his work is rooted in storytelling and social justice. Um, his career as an educator has allowed him to work with young people awaiting trial at the Durham Youth Home, older inmates whose voices have, have been silenced with the Orange County Correctional Facility, um, and, and also high school and college aged men um, pushing to, to, to redefine masculinity in their schools and communities. Um, CJ most recently appointed as the first poet laureate of Chapel Hill. Um, he's committed to speaking truth to power and aims to be a bridge for uh, communities who can't always see themselves in each other. So before I turn to uh, CJ, I also want to introduce Ellen and so that, you know, after CJ, Ellen can take over. Ellen McLarney is the discussant today uh, for the lecture section. Um, and Ellen is an associate professor of um, Asian and Middle Eastern studies and the director of the Middle East Center and the interim director of the Islamic Center at Duke. She's the author of numerous publications and um, particularly Soft Force, Women in Egypt's Islamic Awakening. Um, so CJ, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna share just a little poetry with you all. I'm much more of a performance poet, so I can't hear your like audience applause or affirmation. So you can use little reactions, whatever you need to do. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, I wrote this sort of uh, after watching the film and also just thinking about my life and world and how my life is mirrored. Uh, James Baldwin in a lot of different ways. So just happy to be here with you all. Um, yes. <clears throat> to be whole is a struggle in a broken world. It is to find all the pieces of you and sew them back together in a lifetime. It is not easy to be your full self in a world that wants to split you into mere fractions. Sometimes it requires a journey out to find what is within, to find the all that you could not hear above the noise of a nation torn, trying to drown out the sound of its marginalized, its voices that have been struggling to hear themselves and be heard for centuries on this land that does not belong to anyone and to wrestle with that reality, to be born free and told you are not at every turn that power, Turkish or American, no matter how far you are from the white throne follows you, that power, no matter how far you go follows you, but sometimes it can help to distance yourself, to not be so close, it can allow us to make comparisons, see both worlds, with fresh eyes. I have never thought myself a leader, James says, rather a kind of witness. I imagine he means a witness for the wholeness that can exist in a person when allowed to love and be free on this planet. What it means to bear witness is to move through, is to be in relationship not to isolate, but to find yourself in different space to gain new perspective to honor the life that lives in you and courses through the veins of every human you will meet along this journey. James says, all poets have a very difficult role to play, to bear witness to something that will have to be there when the storm is over, when the dust settles, when the smoke rises, and we are trying to brush off the smell of ashes, something that will be there in the aftermath of all this, all we know to be true and hard and wrought with friction and tension and anxiety, what will be there for us and exist in us now, a quieted voice, a silenced voice, and yet it is there holding on to us, even when we let go of it. They call the call that says love, says be, says see yourself whole to see everyone else holy 
a divine being. It is not by accident that we are all here in this Zoom room today to honor, discuss, and celebrate a person whose life was grounded in going out to reach within and reaching out to go within to, and finding the nuance to create a frame for a world that did not exist for him. And I would hope we'd be encouraged to do the same, not to leave in an effort to escape, but to journey, to bring back something better, to bring back a vision of the world we cannot hear amongst the noise and loud voices between indecisions and decisions, all the things our bodies and minds are going through in this time, I think, I think James wants us to shine as bright as we can. Find your light, find your glow and your sparkle, find the glitter in the dust. Thank y'all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really, that was really powerful and beautiful. And also waking in us to the directions we need to go. Um, my, it's my pleasure and honor today to int introduce Magdalena Zaborowska, professor of Afro-American and African stu and American studies at the University of Michigan. Her work focuses on literary and cultural studies approaches to transatlantic discourses on race, nationality, sexuality, queerness, and gender, with a particular focus on African-American literature. She is author of James Baldwin's Turkish Decades, The Erotics of Exile, published by Duke University. The book explores how James Baldwin fled abroad to escape American racism and homophobia, but also how this time in Turkey helped nurture Baldwin's literary career at its most formative period. Professor Zaborowska also recently published another book with Duke University Press on the time Baldwin spent in France, Me and My House, James Baldwin's Last dec Decade in France, where he lived, talking about where he lived in Saint-Paul-de-Vence Saint until the end of his life. Professor Zaborowska also helped organize the Shea Baldwin online exhibit at the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian this spring. She's also organizer of the James Baldwin Project. She has also authored other books like How We Found America, Reading Gender Through East European Immigrant Narratives, as well as Other Americans, Other Americas. Please give a big welcome to Professor Magdalena Zaborowska. Hello. Hello. You can hear me, right? Um, I'm going to share a screen, but before I do that, let me thank everyone, and especially Adidam and Ellen and Evdow and, and um, Griffin for setting up and for inviting me. I'm very, very grateful and honored to be here. And it's a lovely occasion to revisit uh, the book that was um, published 11 years ago. So I am just thrilled to be speaking with you and I thank you for attending all of you uh, who are listening to this talk. I have a bit of a PowerPoint, so I will share a screen now. Um, everyone can see? Yes, excellent, thank you. Yes. So um, in this talk um, and here on the first slide, you see the photograph by Sadat Pakai that made it to the cover of my book. I'm not showing the book's cover, it's more about Baldwin and sort of the process of how this work got created and also about revisiting. So what I'm trying to do in this brief talk is to talk about how since 11 years ago, I've been working with this project and how it has been enriched and enlarged by interactions with people, by lectures, by students, um, and also by my developing understanding of Baldwin's arc, both authorial arc, literary development, and also his biographical arc. 
And I want to dedicate this talk to the memory of Sadat Pakai, whose incomparable photographs you will see throughout. Uh, there will be quite a few uh, throughout this slideshow. I also want to quote from Baldwin's very early essay, uh, Preservation of Innocence, published in the Paris uh, literary and cultural magazine Zero in 1949, when Baldwin was just uh, 25. And I'm trying to, you can see everything, right? Uh, 1925. So he was a very young person to write about the profound literary genre of the novel. And I, I know it's a longer quotation, but uh, bear with me. A novel insistently demands the presence and passion of human beings who cannot ever be labeled. Once the novelist has created a human being, he, she, they have shattered the label and transcending the subject matter are able for the first time to tell us something about it and to reveal how profoundly all things involving human beings interlock. Without this passion, we may smother to death locking those airless, I'm sorry, my screen just went dark. Sorry, a small technical difficulty. Without this passion, we may all smother to death locked in those airless labeled cells, which isolate us from each other and separate us from ourselves. And without this passion, when we have discovered the connection between that Boy Scout who smiles from the subway poster and that underworld to be found all over America, vengeful time will be upon us. So here you can hear echoes and the Jeremiadic tone that will resurface in the far next time is perhaps best known text from 1963, which was written in Turkey and which incorporates a lot of Turkish imagery, even folk wisdom. And I begin with this quotation and this lovely shot of Pakai, by Sadat Pakai of Baldwin, taking Turkish tea with a samovar and uh, a darker landscape churning behind him, uh, because that revisitation is also about revisiting people who have helped me in my work and who have made this book possible. So in the James Baldwin Review, the open access online journal devoted to the writer in one of the recent issues, I have published a tribute to Sadat Pakai and a close reading of this photograph, which I find iconic, not only for the reason that it hangs at the Smithsonian, but also because it really reflects Baldwin's depth and complexity and his attachment and connection to Turkey as a home, as a perhaps transitory home that enabled his artistic development and led him later on to find a more permanent home in France. So that Pakai's photographs have a power that draws viewers in. They have a power of compassion, of kindness. They also take in the whole Baldwin. They don't focus just on his face or eyes as most American photographers tended to do. They show him as a full complex, sometimes perplexing human being. They also show him interacting with people. They give us windows into his everydayness. And of course, Baldwin was aware that he was a spectacle of sorts in the Turkish streets. Uh, and yet he enjoyed himself thoroughly and he built a life and connections to people there that I hope to preserve on the pages of my work. So a few more shots. This is from Engin Jazar's living room, looking at the Bosphorus. And my first point for today's talk, and we'll have about five, my second point meaning <laughs> behind revisiting a book that came out 11 years ago and on, on which I worked between 2000 and 2007. In Istanbul, Baldwin redefined what exile meant to him. 
And if you consider his life as a series of stages, the first stage when he left for France in 1948 would have been the sort of exile for the reason of racism and homophobia. He needed to get away. He felt he would either kill someone or be killed among racist hatred and among literally spatial material obstacles that he faced as a black queer man from a working class background uh, who had a large family to support. So in Istanbul, this is on the Galata bridge that no longer exists, he found an alternative family in the second phase of his exile, of his journey. After that first escape to France, he returned to the US in 57 and then wanted to leave again by 1961. He was in Turkey and he, as you know from the book, but also from the sort of apocryphal stories, he just showed up at the doorstep of Engin Jazar and Guri Sururi when they were in fact celebrating their marriage and everyone was there, the creme de la creme of Istanbul artistic, intellectual and theatrical society. Uh, and Baldwin sort of walked right in and then as Engin described it to me in an interview, he went to his little room and he wrote and wrote and wrote. And that's how Another Country, his third novel was finished. So that novel, in fact, owes its existence to Istanbul and to meetings with people, to support of artists, to hospitality and sociability of the milieu in which he found himself. So after the first French exile, the Turkish exile, I consider the central and pivotal for his search for home, for his search for his own identity as a black queer man who's a writer, but who also is filled with creativity and longing, desire for fulfillment as a theater director, as a singer, as someone who dreamt of acting and wrote a novel about it. So this is the place that is both generative and nurturing, that is generous in its hospitality, but also in its liminal location between Europe and Asia, like Poland, where I hail from, part of that second world that always falls out of the binary between the first and the third. This is the place where he found himself and realized what it was that he needed to create and to go on as an artist. So for those of you who are not familiar with the map of the city, I highlight here some of the neighborhoods where he lived, his hangouts and his locations. He lived in different apartments. At some point, he rented a, a, a beautiful Pasha's library, um, as it was known, house um, on, the, uh, on the coast where he lived with his large entourage that came after um, publications of another country and the far next time when he actually had the means to live in style. At the beginning he was, as Engin Jazar put it, bedraggled, poor. Basically he had to sleep on couches of friends to get that novel finished. Some other photographs of celebrities visiting. Here's David Leeming, Marlon Brando, there is David Baldwin the youngest brother of um, Baldwin's eight siblings or step-siblings uh, who spent quite a bit of time with him in Turkey and later on became his manager and sort of manager and host and housekeeper. <laughs> he, he had multiple roles by the time they moved to France. Um, and here you see images of the troupe, the theater troupe with whom Baldwin worked um, on the play in 6970. We'll get to that in a bit. I'm just showing you images of a lot of happy faces gathering social over food, over music, over books um, with interesting people. And now I want to focus on the households that is where Baldwin 
thrived and built transitory, but very intensely his own uh, households, be it an apartment near Taksim Square, be it the Pasha's library in his later years, uh, be it that little room in Engin Shazar's um, apartment near Taksim Square. Here he is presented frying fish, in, in fact, frying catfish, southern style, and the woman beside him is Bertie's Redding, um, uh, an African-American artist and singer who was um, his friend and with whom he would hang out quite a bit. Uh, she was a very interesting character, uh, fond of blonde wigs. She adopted a Turkish orphan boy. Um, so there are interesting connections there and interesting um, social circles. Um, I want to go back to show you here in this photo. This is Brenda Keith, who was married to the US cultural attache. And at some point later on in 1970, served as Baldwin's typist. So there were African-Americans in the diplomatic service uh, who also were part of his circle and artists like Bertie's Redding. What also has been so interesting to me is that when we think of domesticity, when we think of authors laboring over their work, we usually picture studies, we picture offices, we sort of don't look at the household and at the other people who might be enabling that labor. And I think in these outtakes from Sadat Pakai's film from another place, we see these moments that have not been widely circulated and discussed. And even though I get to granular detail of domesticity and specifically black queer domesticity Baldwin was creating both in Turkey and in France in my most recent book, I am really um, inspired by the outtakes and I'm sorry they didn't make it to the final cut of Sadat's film this is his housekeeper. I've never been able to find out her name. I know that she appears in some of the outtakes. There's also a little girl at some point. I'm not sure um, of the connection between the woman and the girl, if she's a granddaughter. So, so there are these figures, these women sort of circulating around his um, spaces who prepare his food, who take care of his needs and um, I think it's important to notice and to also realize that thanks to the Turkish location and the beautiful lands through which Sedat Pakai documented Baldwin's presence there, we have access to glimpses of that life, to, to the materiality of it, to food on the table and to the person whose hands prepared that food. And I want to show you one of the brief outtakes so that you get a sense of, I'm gonna make this a brighter, um, of that kind of life, domestic life.
So I would like to pause over this um, frame with Baldwin smiling, scratching, being very <laughs> informal, being very domestic and um, feeling safe, feeling accepted and seen and loved. And I think that's profoundly important for um, our understanding of his life. And I say this because right now there is quite a bit of Baldwin in popular culture. We've had films released about him, a documentary by uh, Peck, and then um, if Bill Street could talk uh, adaptation. Um, and both of them are, of course, the director's takes on Baldwin. Um, what I'm trying to communicate is that there is a convention of representing black bodies in American visual culture that often precludes us from having access to what is natural with other great national figures, artists. So we, we, you think of writers' houses, you think of material legacy of their lives, which is painstakingly preserved. We don't really have that with black intellectuals, with black writers. So to me, only after I had published the book on Turkey and began researching his domesticity and the ways in which African-American domestic environments and domestic traces, literally the material possessions, the material archives of their lives have not been preserved, in fact, have not been considered worth preserving and cherishing, that I can, in revisiting James Baldwin's Turkish decade, really appreciate these moments of intimacy, of domestic bliss, if you will, over food, um, interacting with the housekeeper, as you've seen in the photos, interacting with the kids in the streets. There is such an emphasis in American systems of representation of black bodies on specific racial and gender stereotypes and constructs that we often do not see the real person behind them. And I want to say this very carefully because I write about this uh, um, I'm working on another project, uh, quite a different one, on Baldwin, where I also discuss the so-called Baldwin brand, that is what has been his official narrative depiction and representation in, in US popular culture, where he's been this sort of black popular culture superstar, his words and quotations taken out of context on Twitter, um, yet were his complexity, often the difficulty of his character, and, and many of his Turkish friends described it to me in detail, um, that he was not an easy person to be around when he wrote, that he sometimes got angry, that he sometimes got um, upset or depressed, that there are these aspects to him as a complex, gnarly, um, difficult individual that are obliterated when we see the branded version of him. So in Raoul Peck's I Am Not Your Negro, you hear Samuel Jackson's affectatious voice sounding very masculine and sort of speaking Baldwin's words. But we don't get Baldwin, who was not macho, who was not in any way the race man leader fighter that the Baldwin brand still promotes. And again, leader fighter also means straight, also means heteropatriarchal. So this is a very important moment where the Turkish representations give you someone who is softer, who is much more thoughtful, who is complex, who can be difficult, who's also very sensuous about the food and the clothing and the jewelry. And again, with all the orientalizing stereotypes of Turkey and Istanbul, we can see the temptation for some of the critics to dismiss Baldwin's Turkish years and say, you know, too much Turkey. He's been taken away from the US culture. He's not focusing, he's not being here. He's not seeing things. My argument is that he actually learned how to see better and seeing from another place. 
he learned how to see himself differently. And in fact, through nurturing and hospitality that he experienced to find confidence to be, build his own household um, down the road when he got to France and to Saint Paul de Vence. In this part of the talk, I want to focus on his friendship with Buford Delaney. And this is a relationship, an artistic relationship uh, that to quote from No Name in the Street, the 1972 essay volume that Baldwin also wrote in Turkey, where Baldwin calls on artists and on men specifically to be the midwives of the new world order. So Buford Delaney, who was Baldwin's mentor, whom Baldwin met when he was 17 in Greenwich Village, who became his artistic surrogate father figure, was also someone who helped him acclimate to Turkey and who helped him create a sort of sense of a family he wanted to have. And here you see Bertie's reading with her adopted son. You see Bertie's teenage daughter, Baldwin, and Buford Delaney, whose face we cannot see here. Delaney painted a beautiful portrait of Baldwin that still hangs at um, Engin Jazar's apartment and whose copy I unfortunately cannot show you. Um, he also painted a beautiful picture uh, painting of the Bosphorus at night um, and um, a portrait of Gurish Sururi. And here is a very interesting photograph of Engin Jezar with Gulris and Delaney and Delaney's portrait of Gulris in the middle. Unfortunately, it's just a black and white photo. It's in the book, but I am showing you again this photo because Delaney as this artistic father figure who taught Baldwin how to see. There are famous passages in Baldwin's essays describing how Delaney showed him a puddle of water and said, look, and Baldwin looked down and he couldn't see anything. And he said, look again. And Baldwin looked again. And then, and only then did he see that on top of the water, there was a film of gasoline, a kind of rainbow colored film of gasoline. And in it, inverted as optics would have it, he saw the images of buildings and the city around him. So this is the famous moment, the epiphany, where the writer becomes a painterly writer, where the writer, and we can see this in others, Morrison, for example, begins to understand literary expression as not describing, but showing it. So I connect this powerful transformations continuation to Baldwin's years in Istanbul and to how he thrived with Buford Delaney's surrogate fathering, mothering, midwifery, and also how he created an alternative family. And in my interview with Julie Sururi, um, I heard that. She said, I wanted us to be a family. So you have a sort of triad of Jazar and Sururi and Baldwin, and then Delaney as this beloved benign uh, Francis of Assisi slash Brie Rabbit, Brie Rabbit figure, um, as he was described by friends. A very quick look at some of Delaney's portraits of Baldwin. And um, the one in the middle is the only depiction of Baldwin nude. This is from 1941. It's called The Dark Rapture. And that was painted still in Greenwich Village. But this is the painting that some scholars claim has enabled Baldwin to see himself as beautiful, has in a way by paint on canvas given him the person he could be, he was in the eyes of others, but he could also become as a writer. This notion Baldwin takes with him to France and then to Turkey. And it is in Turkey, in a place that's unlike any other, 
he's been among people whose customs, whose gender and sexual expression he doesn't understand at first. It is also for him as a holder of a passport of a superpower to realize that he has to learn and has to sort of reform himself, reshape himself because of this new place, because of this new location. A large part of Baldwin's um, Turkish achievement concerns his artistic collaborations. And there are quite a few connected to his being the director of the play, uh, Dushenin Dostu, Friend of the Fallen, otherwise based on um, John Herbert's play, Fortune and Men's Eyes, which was staged in Istanbul in 1969 and created quite a scandal. The city closed it down for some time, which created even more publicity. There was um, a whole process of putting it together that I describe at length in the book. What I want to highlight here is that Baldwin was able to, because he was given complete freedom and complete artistic license uh, in Istanbul, excuse me, to shape the play as much as he wanted to in terms of its stage design, even musical score, and in terms of creating a literary seminar with actors who were to play the main characters and whom he basically taught a literary way of reading the play, of seeing the characters before he let them rehearse on stage. So here, Don Cherry and Engin Jazar and Baldwin are working on the score. And just recently, a few months ago, I was contacted by a Swedish journalist who wanted to know more about the play and my work on Baldwin's um, direction of the play in Turkey. And it turned out that the score, that Don Cherry, an original score that Don Cherry composed for the play, which had been considered lost, was discovered of all places in a Northern Swedish cottage somewhere on magnetic tape and has ever since been rescued and um, remastered. So I can play a brief first track of that score for you. <laughs> Um, I was delighted by this find and have been obsessively listening and re-listening to the, to the tracks. Um, I have never seen the play. I think few people still alive I remember seeing it and nobody took a video of it, unfortunately. I just wanted to say that um, the life of an artistic project has has the life of this artistic project of Baldwin's directing the play has left as if concentric circles kind of reverberating throughout the world. So I can say now that from Turkey to Sweden, like for me, from Poland to the United States, to Turkey to, to get this work done, there has been this incredible um, artistic collaboration among scholars, among journalists, about researchers that reflects the kinds of creative um, collaborative moments that Baldwin enjoyed in Istanbul. And I also am struck by how the music of Cherry and the kind of completely accidental way they uh, came across one another. Cherry was touring Europe. He was studying folk music 
all over uh, Europe and, he, and Asia. And he came through Istanbul and they literally sort of ran, um, ran into each other um, as Baldwin was walking in the Jazar. And then Cherry was happy to produce a score and he had his Swedish wife and kids, um, the musical kids, Nana Cherry is in the forefront here, um, if you know her, uh, what a cutie. And so again, Istanbul was a place of meetings, but also a place of collaborations where Baldwin was allowed was what he was not allowed to do in the United States. He could not shape the production of Blues for Mr. Charlie in 1964 on Broadway as he would have wanted to, he could not. Whereas in Turkey, Engin Jazar basically told him, do what you want. If Baldwin wanted a specific stage design, they worked on it. He wanted specific sounds of iron bars being shot, being pushed, shot with a clang. He got it. He got this original score. So again, think about how that moment of meeting Cherry, but then the whole process of collaborating and creating the place, staging it, then taking it on a tour around the country to places like Izmir, where people were really welcoming it. And then this play becoming a turning point in the history of Turkish theater in the 20th century with all of the political implications of sexuality and violence and sexual violence um, and sexual violence among men that the play depicts all of that was revolutionary. It wasn't just sort of cool and new and interesting. It was revolutionary. And it happened in ways that perhaps it's hard for us to, to imagine in the 1960s. But then at that moment, Turkish society was perhaps more secular and more open to such collaborations, at least the circles in which Baldwin was moving. Um, and again, I don't know enough about contemporary Turkey to be talking about it but I really um, cherish that moment of sort of happenstance of accidental coming across collaborators and friends and harnessing that to produce something unique, to produce something uh, revolutionary. So Baldwin's method in directing the play was very much focused on being a writer and also being a lover of literature. So I interviewed um, Ali Poyazolu, I interviewed Zeynep Oral, who served as Baldwin's assistant. And I also interviewed Oktay Balamir, who was one of the translators of the play. And they all told me that the actors couldn't understand why Baldwin would have them sitting for ever, for three weeks, in fact, reading the play, creating treatments about the characters and literally asking them to <laughs> interpret the text in ways we would do in a literary seminar in academe. And it worked. Then everyone, once they were on stage, was in character, was inhabiting not just the character as written, but also the body of a person they kind of co-created with Baldwin. And because the play contains some drag scenes, this is also important for understanding the connection historically between then and the contemporary drag scene in Turkey and elsewhere. And here are the iron bars Baldwin insisted upon. And um, one of the photos from the program and Baldwin wrote a text um, about the play and about his directing in which he connects fortune and men's eyes to the cherry orchard by Chekhov. So this is also a very important moment for his theatrical um, development because remember Baldwin wrote plays. He basically wrote in every literary genre known to humanity. So uh, after Eamon, corner, the first one, then there was Blues for Mr. Charlie, and then The Welcome Table, which was not published, which I've been writing about quite a bit. And I have offered to edit it for publication for the estate, but did not get that permission. So Baldwin saw himself as a director directing in Istanbul in Turkey, as not just an African-American writer performing this job, but also someone who was engaging world theater 
who was aware of how theatrical ideas travel and how literary imagination travels. So when uh, Gyuri Sururi wrote about it in her memoir, she, you know, she was very adamant about the kind of great scandal it created, but also the great opening it created for discussions of ex sexual exploitation of street children, for how homosexuality had been treated, how violence among men had been treated. Uh, Baldwin also became a glamorous kind of rock star like figure in Turkey. At that time, his popularity in the United States was waning. He was not seen as with the times and he was vilified both by black nationalists and by white liberals who thought he was too angry and out of touch. Again, the kinds of narratives that um, narrowly conceived narratives that defined his official image. I love this description from Charles Adelson. He was a journalist who lived in Istanbul and I think he moved there uh, to be able to live with his boyfriend um, as a couple. And um, the descriptions of Baldwin's persona, of his jewelry, of his clothing, again, these detailed moments of seeing like in Sadat Pakai's um, film and photos. And lastly, Baldwin had quite a few admirers and had um, even women falling in love with him. That was sort of his charm, his charisma. So one of them, and that's in the book as well, uh, wrote a poem and drew a sketch of his face. And I just wanted to end with this. Um, you are ours, one of us. Your past may be there, but from now on, your future is with us. You are in our hearts. So he remains as a presence. He remains as a fixture, but also I think as a revolutionary inspiration as someone who um, continues to oftentimes be seen as relevant and as exciting and as a guide, as a teacher, as a witness. And I end with the words of Olga Tokarczuk, the recent Nobel Prize winning author from Poland who talks about literature having become a field for the exchange of experiences, an agora where everyone can tell of their own fate. It is a democratic space. Anyone may speak up. Everyone can create a voice for herself. Never in the history of humanity have so many people been writers and storytellers. I don't think Baldwin would have been on social media. I don't think he would have been tweeting uh, those sentences and paragraphs he writes are not quite conducive to bare bones language. Uh, all in all, I think he's given us a map as peoples, as individuals. And again, at the center of his career, in the middle of his growth and development as an author, as an artist, as an intellectual, as an ancestral figure for us, stands Turkey and his decade there and the exciting seen and unseen, glamorized and as yet unrecovered moments. Thank you. So uh, do we open for questions uh, right now? And, and I'm not sure how I want to be mindful of the time. Yeah, let's open it up to, to, to questions from everyone. Magdalena, if you want to uh, exit out of your shared screen as well. Sure. Thank you. That was a very moving uh, presentation. Thank you so much. I feel like I learned not, not only learned so much, but was very um, inspired by your 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 interpretation. 
Thank you, Magdalena. It was lovely to see some of those photographs, the outtakes I'd never seen before. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, it's been uh, archive mining time. I, I have quite a bit of stuff from uh, 2001 uh, and 2007 that I would like to make available. I am working on a digital collection at the University of Michigan that will be open access, but I'm beginning with my latest project in Baldwin's house. But if I live long enough, I will get to my Turkish archive as well. I would like to make it available. Thank you. It was very interesting. Questions, comments? Um, thank you have you. a copy of the, oh, sorry. It's okay, you go ahead, Arda. No, I was just curious, to, uh, you mentioned the, the, the uh, painting in, in, in your talk, um, which I was just curious about, if you had a copy of the, of the painting of the Bosphorus at night? I have to look for it. I, um, because I took the photo in 2001, it was on a Chrome slide and um, I had to digitize and transfer it. I can dig it up for you. Um, I'm, I apologize. I just was not able to get it formatted to, to you know, for a PowerPoint presentation as yet. Would you, would you like me to describe the painting? Yeah, if you, I'm just in a few words. I, I'm just mm -hmm. really curious about it, yeah. Yeah, the, the, um, I describe it in the, um, in the book a little bit. Um, the painting is about a foot and a half by like three quarters foot, so it's a rectangle. And it's an oil painting. Um, I think it was created around 68, 69, uh, and Delaney, painted um, literally, first you look at it and you see this sort of mass of churning indigo and, and foamy shapes. And then you realize it's the waters of the Bosphorus. And then the lights reflected in the water are actually the city. So what I love about that painting, um, and, and I really want to be able to show it to you, but in a, in a, you know, in a format that does it justice. What, what I love about it is that it's almost a metaphorical replay of that epiphany that Baldwin had with Delaney in Greenwich Village when he looked at the puddle of water. So, you know, what is the surface? What is the depth? <laughs> and, and what is the reflection, right? How do all of them play together and give you images, inspire your imagination to tell a story. And so in the Bosphorus at Night painting by Delaney, you almost see all of that. You can see that story reflected if you know the story. So again, everything is in the eye of the beholder. But I think it tries to communicate, again, my very personal reading of it, the beauty of these waters, the beauty of, um, of that space where Baldwin found himself and which he traversed. You see him on the boat at, at the end of Sadat Pakai's film. Um, and he was very drawn to the water. He, uh, in the 50s, when he was um, at a writer's colony, he wrote his friend Sol Stein that he would love to build a house on a mountain overlooking the sea. He came close at Pasha's library to living in such a place. He also considered buying a house and settling in Istanbul permanently. But then demands of family and publishing kind of drew him away. And as you see at the end of Pakai's film, he's sort of ready to move on to go somewhere else. Thank you so much, Magdalena. This was um, a pleasure. Um, the really um, inspiring and probably what we needed today. <laughs> um, so um, those photographs and you know recordings, uh, it was such a treat. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm like always so impressed by his network in Istanbul. Like you talked about, of course, his close friends. Um, 
family. Basically, they they create it among themselves. But uh, and and so these are really progressive people, um, and um, you know um, artists and intelligentsia of, of the time. Dissident voices. You know he's been. You know he met with Yashar Kemal, for instance. Um, you know, um, but the, these are really. Um, you know, modernized and westernized group and in Turkey. And although this is not the time of the Islamic movement or whatsoever, but but still, you know, this is a Muslim country. Um, so, I mean, so was he, do you think, was he aware that he was seeing the country from a certain lens? Um, you know, I mean, and outside of lands, there is another Turkey that, you know, he was probably, um, I mean, I, we don't see it in the film or, or, or any other, um, you know, you know, writings of him. What do you think? You know, was he aware of it? Did he mention, um, or, or, you know, um, what is his like take on this whole separation between like, you know, the, this like small group of people and the rest of the country? I think he had a, he had a notion that he lived in a, you know, in a sort of elitist world uh, for a lack of a better world. These people were this sort of intellectual artistic elite, you know, when I spoke to the cultural attaché Canton Keith um, about the time he lived there, he said, you know, these people were educated, multilingual, they drank whiskey, they were not uh, sort of, you know, bound by religious dogma or, or even um, ideologies of conduct. They were um, sort of citizens of the world, even though they were also very Turkish and, and very sort of locally connected. And, um, and I'm thinking of people like Jevat Chapan, who was a poet and intellectual. I also was lucky enough to meet him and interview him in 2001. And I remember he said, we just read each other's work and talked about it. And then he said, Baldwin had trouble finishing another country and he couldn't settle on a, on a resolution, on a kind of denouement that would work for the novel. And Chapin said, you know, I read it, we talked about it, and then I told him, this is it, do this. And then, <laughs> so, so this is a little known fact of a kind of artistic collaboration, but also the ways in which he was completely sort of separated from everyday life. At the same time, I heard from others that Baldwin loved strolling the streets, that he knew enough Turkish words to exchange greetings, to buy his fruit or to, you know, say hello to grocers on the way. Um, in Pakai's film, you actually have a moment when an elderly man with a heavy load on his back bumps into Baldwin at a book stand when Baldwin's looking at the books there. And that moment is actually that, you know, that one flash point where the Turkey Baldwin doesn't really live in comes into the frame is, is shown by, by Pakai. Uh, there is another moment where a woman with a headscarf bumps into him. And when you begin to analyze the film, you see that there are hardly any women there. That actually that one woman is what you see because everybody there is male. So you have a certain understated nod towards the culture, which excludes women or, or does not focus on women in public spaces as much. And again, I, you know, I went to Istanbul in 2001 and 2007. Um, I did not see it through his eyes, but I can imagine that he was very aware of these differences. There was an incident in Erdek that David Leeming describes where Baldwin was beaten up by a magician, some you know, kind of snakes or snake oil salesman, <laughs> and his assistant. And 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 you know, he was attacked, he misunderstood, he, he thought they were friendly, they were, you know, uh, walking together, and maybe there was some kind of an erotic attraction there. I don't know, but that encounter ended really badly. He he got beaten up to the point that he had to be taken to a hospital. So, so to say, you know, so there was reaction and hostility, even homophobia and violent response uh, to his persona, to his presence among some people. Mm -hmm. um, he was interested in. Um, 
dissidents. So I remember he wrote a letter in support of one of the dissidents when he was already well known in Turkey. Um, I think that was facilitated by um, Engin Jazar. Uh, he had several boyfriends and lovers um, who were Turkish. Uh, one of them may have been Kurdish. He was very interested in the Kurdish uh, ethnic group and uh, his friendship with Yashar Kemal, even though they didn't have a language in common because they, you know, they Baldwin didn't speak enough Turkish or Kurdish, it didn't matter. And so um, David Leeming told me and other people who knew them, uh, John Freely among them, that it was a joy to see the two of them because Yashar Kemal was tall and imposing and incredibly masculine and you know, Baldwin, 110 pounds soaking wet, petite and, and very queer, uh, singing together. So they, they found psalms and songs in common that they would sing together. Kemal singing uh, Kurdish folk songs, Baldwin uh, singing certain spirituals that he grew up with in, in the Pentecostal and Baptist traditions of the Black Church. And they had a friendship despite not being able to communicate by language, but they communicated by other means. And I think uh, Baldwin was an observant uh, person. He was a witness, he paid attention. And I think some of the photographs that Pakai took of him interacting with people in the streets, interacting with people outside of his intellectual circle, give us this valuable information. But you're right, there is that um, part of Turkey he never got to know, but he remained interested in uh, Muslims. Uh, when he lived in France, he had a Muslim gardener about whom he wrote. He, in fact, planned a novel called No Papers for Muhammad uh, that he wrote a treatment of that was found in his papers there. Uh, that novel never uh, developed, but he had a plan for it. Uh, he also read the Quran when I documented his archive in France. Uh, among the books that were salvaged, I found a copy of the Quran. I also found um, Arabic scripts on some pieces of paper. There was even his name, um, James Baldwin, written in Arabic by someone, I don't know who, I just found a torn out piece of paper with doodling and then pieces of script. So again, this is the most recent uh, work, meaning that those concentric circles of the Turkish decades are continuing because I'm finding traces and material objects related to Turkey in the archive that I found um, in uh, Saint Paul de Vence. That's a long answer, I apologize. Oh, great, great, thank you. I'm gonna call on people. Corina, do you have any uh, any 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 questions or Burak, Miriam, Sinan? And I see right now I can see that Kathy Pakai is among yeah. us. So I'm yeah. thrilled that she's here because um, she and Sadat have been dear friends and um, my dedication of this talk to him is... Uh, uh, thank you very much, Magdalena. He would have loved it. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> I wish I could have spent the whole talk r r literally uh, talking about his art because that's also something that I think needs to be studied more extensively and that beautiful archive of his work needs to find a good home where it can be cherished and preserved. Well, thank you. At the moment, uh, the uh, when the pandemic ends, I hope uh, Yale is, uh, uh, digitizing all of the film and the outtakes as well. Excellent, that's great news, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, I thought that was really beautiful what you were talking about, about the domestic scenes and, you know, the people who are in his domestic space and that image of him, you know, eating and, you know, the people he interacted with and, and just his daily life and that kind of, humanization that comes from depicting him at ease. Yes, thank you for this comment. And 
with the latest book on his house in France, of course, I was naturally focusing on domesticity, but in the process of researching and writing it, and, and now that I'm working on this collection, and I'm also trying to write an ebook that will be open access that kind of will talk about the processes of digitizing and uh, looking at black digital humanities approaches to this material. Um, what I found out is that we just, in, in the US, we don't have a culture of preserving black lives in the ways that you know, we have for other national figures. So uh, I actually did talk to the um, curators at Beinecke, to archivists at Beinecke at Yale and, and, and said, you know, there is that archive in France, why don't you purchase it? And they said, well, these are just books. <laughs> We, we don't need them. I mean, these are just books. And I said, but these are Baldwin's books. It's his library. Imagine you could have a reading room furnished with his books. Uh, we would know what he was reading. I mean, I learned a lot about what he was reading and studying. I didn't know he was reading the Quran until I found that volume with his, you know, materials and, and pages and things. I didn't know. Um, I what I actually write about at the end of the most recent book is that we have a racialized approach to archiving uh, because at the very Beinecke where I was surprised they wouldn't want the Baldwin collection from France, they display Walt Whitman's reading glasses. That's an object, a domestic object, a material object. I would say even maybe less important than a book from a library. <laughs> so there's that inconsistency and that um, almost, it, it's as if, you know, I was trying to explain to the archivists what that meant to me as a scholar. And I thought, you know, I've studied this for 20 years, you better take my word, but these much younger people said, no, we're not interested. And then a few months later, they acquired the whole archive of Jonathan Lethem, which included dead tree artifacts and caricatures of vomiting cats, uh, you know, drawn by his friends during drunken parties. So, okay, that does not compute. <laughs> so, again, I think in a way we are in a moment, and I hope some of the moments we are diff with difficulty living through these days will yield a new approach to literary legacy and to material traces, literally the matter of black lives. This is what we need to be doing. That Baldwin's house in France was left to rot and was lost and was demolished and turned into luxury condos. That's a shame of international proportions. But that's, you know, that's where we are. So there is a lot of catching up that we have to do. And I just hope that our work continues and we teach our students about these issues. We explain them kindly. Um, but I also have to say a lot of it has been very, very personal and has been very painful and has caused anger and anguish and physical uh, you know, ailments from stress and travel. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, as a literary scholar, I'm, I'm sort of told it's not usual, it's not expected that people travel like this. I felt I had to go to Turkey to literally walk the streets he once walked, because I knew the place could tell me something, and it did. Along with Sadat Pakai and a host of other people, I haven't mentioned, I, I think I've mentioned pretty much everyone I talked to. Um, um, so, thank you, Turkey. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, that, this, this great um, uh, passage in your book where, <clears throat> where um, uh, Baldwin says to Yashar Kemal that uh, he, he feels very free in Turkey. And, and uh, Yashar Kemal said, you know, he was obviously very, not, not just, you know, has, has, has a Kurdish uh, background, but is a sort of an engaged leftist, says, well, that's because you're an American. And, and so between 1961 and, and 71 is, is a period between two military coups 
And that period is referred to, referred to as it, some people consider the the 62 constitution as being the most left-leaning constitution, the most liberal constitution in, in Turkish, modern Turkish history. And um, so I guess my question was, did you find any sense of either in the, the huge rise in anti-Americanism, obviously, uh, with this fleet coming, et cetera, and being kicked out of Turkey. In, in, that, in that period between the two coups where Baldwin is there, um, is, is there any kind of, you mentioned a little bit about his uh, support for dissident intersection of, of his politics and kind of left-leaning politics in Turkey? Oh, definitely. He he never would call himself that. As you may know, he detested labels. Mm -hmm. He was briefly a part of the Socialist Youth League, uh, mostly because he fell in love with a friend who invited him to join, a male friend um, who later committed suicide and became an inspiration for Rufus in another country, which is another connection to Turkey. But he was, um, I think his political awareness during his Turkish years grew as he got to know people and as he began to understand how the country worked. I think at first he was mostly concerned with finishing his book and he lived like a hermit. That's what I was told by, by Jezar and Sururi in Japan. But then he was very sympathetic and in fact uh, liked that secular model and that openness to experimentation, um, that love for, for the theater, for the happening, for the street, for the passage of flowers where people sort of interacted and discussed stuff. Um, I know also that he liked the nightclubs, that he frequented places that were queer places that were often not very openly um, frequented by everyone. So part of that leftist politics was also support for sexual and gender minorities. And I want to make this very clear that he was aware that gender roles and conduct and masculinity work very differently in Turkey, but he still was aware of heteropatriarchal oppression. He was aware of women um, traditionally being kept out. And you can see this in the part of the Far Next Time where he describes his visit with um, Elijah Muhammad at the compound in Chicago on, on the south side where you know, he visits uh, the Nation of Islam and he sees the kind of women, uh, consorts, lovers, you know, mothers of the prophets or, or, or Elijah Muhammad's children. And he's, you know, he's upset by that. He, he sees that they don't eat at the same table. So he did not like gender division and he did not like misogyny. And by the time he gets to France and he's befriended Audre Lorde and um, he's you know, talked with Nikki Giovanni and other black feminists, he gets on a very different journey of understanding gender. And his late essays talk about androgyny. In his last play, he has a character who could be trans. So he's really developing and changing his views. And what I love about it is that his first understanding of queerness as liberating comes from Turkey. And that's also a leftist concept, you know, that's queerness in and of itself is a radical concept. And again, I, I have no knowledge of how it works on the ground right now, because I haven't been, unfortunately, for to Turkey for a while. Um, but what strikes me is that Baldwin keeps being relevant. So I've had just recently two interviews with um, Turkish journalists who work for the BBC. And one of them, the, the book talk um, is available online. Uh, and I talk about Baldwin's uh, life in Turkey and, and Baldwin's Turkish decade. I don't know if you were aware of that, but so, so I'm, I'm just sensing there is a lot of interest in his ideas and in his legacy as someone who did contribute to Turkish culture and who as a thinker was progressive and frankly anti-religious. His views very clearly expressed in the far next time, again, which one was written in Turkey. So I think whatever form of fundamentalism he, he encountered, he 
did not like and he spoke against it. So in, in, in that book, he talks about it, you know, if God stopped serving his purpose, it's better, you, you, we better get rid of him. So it's a very radical statement from someone who was a teen preacher for, you know, for three years, who um, bested his father as a, as a religious orator and a scripture quoter. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think this idea of I I, I know that, that we're coming to a close in, but uh, but I think this idea about home um, is and domesticity is also really interesting. You know, this, you know, him searching for a safe place. I mean, and and um, also like kind of this search for origins at this time, right? Um, uh, I I was kind of reflecting on the um, there's this. Uh, you know, the home and the domestic is like the seat of all material life, as you kind of point out. And yet in literary histories, it becomes completely immaterial. It's like not in the record. And that's like one reason that, um, you know, women writers uh, always kind of have been secondary in that sense because of them, you know, their sort of domestic responsibilities. And I was kind of reflecting on that, um, you know, with regards to Leroy Jones, Amiri Baraka, because, you know, he had that collection of essays called Home that he wrote just when he was, um, you know, sh shacking up or, you know, when he was uh, with uh, Amina Baraka. And, you know, there's yet this um, whole struggle in their relationship where he was the writer and she kind of had literary, her own artistic and literary um, ambitions and was never quite able to realize them. Um, and yet she's like preserved almost immaculately his archive, like in their house in Newark and then, you know, her son's the mayor. So, um, you know, it's like almost like a museum and she's like reigned over that museum in some ways and preserved that for him. And yet like her own you know, poetic ambitions have been completely frustrated. And she's right now, she said she was trying to like market, um, you know, her own collection of poetry, but nobody's really interested. And I, I was thinking, how could nobody be interested in, yes. in the poetry? I mean, it seems un, unfathomable. But but I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in if you haven't finished yet. That was it. So I am so excited by this comment and question. I've worked with a graduate student uh, in our PhD program who's, I hope, completing her dissertation on, on, on this very issue on, on Amina Baraka's um, life and her ambitions and, and literally on that house as, as an archive. So I am struck by how gender and how gendered writer's legacy is. So we have, you know, we have this sort of understanding that in Marcel Proust's house in Paris is this sort of sanctuary and people pilgrimage there. And yes, we have what, four houses of black writers. We have Frederick Douglass's house, we have Alex Haley's. And then there, is, uh, there are a couple of others that escape me that are not precisely house museums. So when you think of Ernest Hemingway having six houses, in various parts of the world. And nobody questions it, meaning, oh, this is our national writer. Where is that sort of passion also for men who do not conform to the heteropatriarchal norm, who are not seen as sort of national literary figures and whose domesticity therefore is not seen as exemplary or even worth preserving. So your connection between Baraka's work and also Baraka's exclusion of women from his sense of kind of accomplishment and creating this new nation within nation, right? Baldwin got that, Baldwin got that. And he later on in France, he really thought a lot about it. And his later work just above my head, especially creates this very, very radical revolutionary vision of what I call black queer domesticity. And I say in that book and, and, and have you know, concluded that he found that idea in Turkey 
because of the sociability, because of, yes, he was in a bubble of kind of intellectuals and artists, but these were such colorful, interesting characters. And they, you know, some of them possibly objectified him. I was astounded when Engin Jazar used the N word in our interview in 2001. Uh, you know, different ways of seeing and thinking and using language, obviously. But what I want to say is that, you know, misogyny is very often a sidekick to homophobia. Mm -hmm. So in the lack of preservation of Baldwin's domestic matter, I also see this way in which queer men or non-normative black bodies are left out of the discussion because even when we preserve african-american literary history women are like you said relegated to the margins still and why is it that we don't read women and men together they are writers you know everybody's a, an accident of geography and genetics we should read them together according to the kinds of stuff they write so Baldwin reads beautifully with Toni Morrison, with Anne Petrie, with uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, <laughs> you know, it, but we don't do it because there is that separation and division, but also um, marginalization of gender because of gender and sexuality. And the women who helped Baldwin become the artist he 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 is to us are also unspoken. I mean, I write about them. I, I spend a lot of time on them in the new book. So he had a teacher, a very young woman who was a communist from Ohio, who came to Harlem to work and work in the Work Progress Administration, uh, directing plays with children, black children, and who basically, because Baldwin's father was afraid to refuse a white woman, took him to cinema, to theater who read books with him, you know, who pushed him and believed in him because his own parents weren't able to do that. Mm -hmm. And then he had you know, friends in Turkey, bosom friends and in France, there were always women in his life, but his first idea for you know, metaphorical language was his mother at the opening, in the opening sentences of No Name in the Street his mother holding a piece of black velvet and saying, oh, I think it's a good idea. And he was maybe five at the time, he connected this figurative thinking, metaphorical thinking to a piece of black velvet. Think about it, how deeply connected to kind of feminine symbology and feminine ways of conceptualizing um, sensuous fabric creation, arachne, you can spin it forever, right? Um, anyway, sorry for running on and on. That's great. Yeah, that's, uh, Amina Bardaka has a really good poem where she's, um, she talks about, it's a little Kubla Khan, she's writing the poem and she's looking out the window and, and then a child comes and interrupts her and she's like, I lost the thread, now it's time to make dinner, now it's time to pick the kids up. And it's gone yeah but that's the material reality of that domestic space right exactly and also the flip side of it is a certain kind of masculinity mm -hmm. that prevents women from realizing themselves and we you know we've had this much of it um all over um, around us um but but baldwin was also aware and he takes it to task in if Bill Street could talk in just above my head, he actually interrogates black masculinity for certain ways in which it, you know, oppresses women, forces them to their knees in church and black folks in general. There is a complex critique of masculinity and progressive embrace of femininity. And again, um, you know, there isn't time to get into the deep theory about this, but I think the non-binary ways of seeing, the kind of queer ways of seeing for a lack of a better word, is, is what Baldwin first glimpsed in Turkey and then developed throughout his later works in France. Yeah, just one more thing is, is so in that uh, kind of that article that I wrote, which was just like in my own kind of exploratory, I a little bit failed at it, but I was 
kind of trying to recuperate how Baldwin, you know, came to Durham and he visited these two sites, which was the Royal Ice Cream, which were the site of these first, you know, some of the earliest protests in, in the, the United States. And then um, the mosque there. And there are these two monuments that are gone. I mean, they mm -hmm. are wiped from you know the 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 physical landscape there's now a school where the royal ice cream used to be and apartment buildings where the mosque used to be the mosque still exists but um but in a different location uh and you know just at this time we're kind of thinking about monuments and in some ways that muslim history of america has also been kind of written out of our um national consciousness Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have colleagues um, in American culture who work on various types of Muslim culture and Islamic culture and popular culture and ways in which um, immigrant bodies have been represented. So I am very lucky um, to kind of be connected through the work to these issues. But I think Baldwin was very aware um, that in every society in which religious fundamentalism was allowed to flourish, there were repercussions in terms of gender and that, that women and sexual minorities would always be sort of repressed and left out um, of the equation. And then um, I think his understanding of how, of how this connects to issues of social space, such as you know, location, mm -hmm. uh, a temple, uh, a square, literally physical place uh, that also makes memories. And, and in this, I am really moved by the work of Dolores Hayden, of Derek Fields, people who work on architecture and architectonics of blackness and who, um, who also try to harness the ways in which memory functions spatially. So in, in the later book, I work with um, social space, storytelling, and um, identity formation in a kind of triangular way to show how Baldwin, having seen how things can be different yet the same because of his life and experience in Turkey, then develops a theoretical approach to national identity. And you hit it on the, exactly on the nail, Ellen, with this connection to monumental history mm -hmm. and the physical disappearance and also how we can read into those disappearances and absences. So, so the very fact that Baldwin will never have a writer's house museum in the United States, in the country where he was born, that the most he got is a plaque on a house in Greenwich Village where he lived and a piece of street in Harlem, the, you know, the James Baldwin place, um, that's all. And, and it's actually heartbreaking that, you know, there is no, <laughs> it's just a complex story, but. But, but this revival, like, I, you know, um, of him through the film, the photography, also the, um, the music or Jasmine Ward, you know, that kind of revival of consciousness about him. I mean, doesn't he live on through these like various media. I mean, there's also that opera, there's an opera recently done that was like inspired by him. Right, and there have been the Life Arts Festival in 2014, you know, in New York City. There have been events. Um, I love it. I think the more Baldwin, the merrier. Yeah. There are also, you know, there is merchandise. You can buy t-shirts with his quotations and his face, and in fact, so that Pakai's photos have been stolen and printed on <laughs> merchandise. Wow. So you can see that there is a sense of capitalizing on Baldwin in many ways. But I also want to note that the Baldwin brand, meaning how can we capitalize on him and how can we reshape him and represent him to have him serve our needs rather than look at to what he was theorizing, what he was telling us. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I caution activists because sometimes we take something out of context and we use it in ways that include, exclude someone. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I was giving a talk on Baldwin and the black nationalists said, you know, we have to get rid of white people and we have to get rid of queers and women have to serve and be health meets and, and you know, Baldwin hated it. You cannot use Baldwin to then proclaim kind of exclusionary identity notions that goes against what he was fighting for, goes against the philosophy of him, of his, which I call his humanism, his black queer humanism. And this is the subject of the book I'm working on now. He in fact spent his whole life developing a philosophical system of thought and developing ways to understand identity through understanding himself, through using genre that women use like autobiography, right? Through building a domestic environment in which men were supposed to behave like women. When he was dying, he did not have nurses. His brother, his former lovers, his friends served as nurses. He wanted men to be able to do what women always do because he knew without it, we are not wholly human. So, you know, here be dragons. Each of us contains the other, male and female, female and male, <laughs> black and white, white and black. He later, I think, came to understand this even more complexly. Um, so in the Cross of Redemption, his last piece, he talks about complexity is our only salvation and love is where you find it. Wow, what an inspiring talk. It was so wonderful to listen to you. Thank you. It's been my honor and my pleasure and privilege because it's been a while since I've had a literary conversation. <laughs> and um, it's hard to really lecture on Zoom and to have a sense of an audience, but you have been wonderful. And thank you very much for making this happen and for hosting me. And um, Well, thanks for, thanks for being here. It was such thank a treat. You. Well, thank you, Ellen, and you know, cool. especially this part, last part was like priceless. You know, you know it was so good. Uh, I hope one day we can have you here physically. <laughs> oh, I would love it. I would love it. Let's just hope we can do this in person and have a nice meal after and yes. raise a glass to James Baldwin and to yes. you know the welcome table he's created for us. We've been able to reenact it on Zoom. You know, by the feet. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for coming. Bye.